All right, it is five o'clock, so we're gonna go over to our keynote tonight. Um, so thank you for all of you who have been hanging out with us during our esports summit here. Um, been exciting to have all of our previous panelists, but we've got one more to go. And then after our panel, if you are, you know, all this talk about gaming and play has inspired you to get involved. Um, I originally we were gonna have our uh, Jackbox night over on our Twitch account, but apparently our Valorant team is just doing too well, so our Valorant team is still going to be on our Twitch. So I will send an invitation through Discord um, and a link at the end. Um, and if anybody wants to play some Jackbox games, um, if you've never played them before, they're very casual, they're very fun. Um, you just need to have a tablet or a smartphone. All the things will be self-contained in our in our stream, um, and we'll have some fun to close out our night after uh, dealing with some really important but sometimes heavy topics. Um, so just wanted to lead in with that. Um, our moderator for this section is going to be Shana. Um, so I will kick it over to Shana so that she can do the proper introductions or let us introduce ourselves as she sees fit. So Shana, take it away. Yeah, so um, we also have the, if you're in person or if you want to stop by, we have the uh, Oculus is set up to play Climb. And also we have a bunch of cake. So please come and eat cake if you can. Um, but yeah, this is a mix between fun and lightheartedness in this panel, but also some heavy topics. So I'm excited. Um, let's go ahead and just have our four panelists introduce themselves. Mike, do you want to go first? Sure. I, was, I just I probably should have done that when I brought everybody back in. But hey, you know, we'll just keep bouncing around. So yeah, my name is Mike Jewell. I am the esports coordinator here at University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, and before that, I was a K-12 instructor. I got my master's in education, um, and I am all about involving gaming in all aspects. I, I think that, that well, we'll get into all of it, but I'm just excited to share all these conversations and talk with our panelists about um, the mental health and social emotional aspects that gaming, the good, the bad, and everything in between. And I'm gonna call out Kim to go next so that we can keep it going. All right, my name is Kim Frost. I'm a PhD candidate in educational psychology and instructional design through the interdisciplinary studies here at UAS. Um, my current research focuses on the relationship between play and learning in adults and how that relationship can really inform the design of our online learning spaces. So though I've spent a lot of time looking at um, why people play and the effects of the brain of play on the brain and learning really not really with video gaming in particular but that's how i ended up um, teaching uh psychology of play here at uaf and meeting shana john do you want to go next yeah, I can do that. Uh, so my name is John Spire. I'm a SVP of partnerships for an esports organization called Dignitas. Um, I'm uh, an esports lifer kind of person. So I've worked in this space pretty diligently for the last 15 years or so. Um, I also sit on the board of a mental health charity uh, that focuses on providing mental health services for those who can't afford it otherwise called uh, You Are Rad. Um, yeah, glad to be a part of this conversation. All right, I guess that uh, that leaves me. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Kelly Dunlap. I'm a licensed and practicing clinical psychologist. I also am the associate director of community programming at a take the at a nonprofit called Take This, which is a mental health charity dedicated to the mental health and wellness of game players as well as game developers. I'm also the chair of the International Game Develop Game Developer Association's Mental Health Special Interest Group. I have a master's in game design and I teach game design to grad students at American University's Game Center. So thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Awesome, thank you. Um, so for our first question, uh, why in your opinion do you think people play games? And Kim, would you like to go first? Well, you can ask any eight-year-old why people play and or why they play and they'll say because it's fun. So you really have to start to look at why is gaming so much fun? Um, play in itself is an innate driver of behavior, just the same as eating, sleeping, sex. So all mammals, all birds, even some introverts play. So our brains are kind of 
they're hardwired to play and the physiological rewards we experience when we play, which result in those feelings of fun and joy, suggest an evolutionary advantage to engaging in play behaviors that somehow increases our chances of survival, right? So there's been a lot of debate around why play is advantageous, but when scientists started um, looking at what happens in the absence of play, things start to really come into focus. And so when play is restricted, it's really devastating in terms of mental health. When you look at rats in a laboratory, uh, neuroscientists have concluded that Play deprived rats are anxious and fearful in new environments. Uh, they don't develop proper social skills. They aren't able to regulate their behavior with different social partners. They can't solve problems. So they end up really fearful and lacking the confidence they need to even try to solve a problem. So socially, it's a disaster for them. Um, if you have two male rats, one of whom has had the opportunity to play during adolescence and one who hasn't, and then you put a female with them, the rat who didn't get to play never gets to reproduce. So the likely purpose of play is to develop our creative problem solving abilities, the confidence in your own ability to solve problems, which is coupled with increased self-esteem and self-efficacy and confidence with just being in our, like a really uncertain world around us, right? So the ability to um, play develops the, just these vital survival skills. So that's rats and it's a little harder to study it in people, but a similar thing happens when humans are deprived of play. Um, besides taking the play history of serial killers and finding common history of play deprivation, which is just really disturbing. Um, a group of scientists have been monitoring the decline of free play in America. When I was a kid, we lived in neighborhoods and our parents basically kicked us out on Saturday morning and we were expected to stay out and play all day with no adult supervision, right? Hours and hours of unsupervised free play, which naturally comes with risks. So we got ourselves into plenty of scrapes and then we had to rely on ourselves and our kid network to get out of them. But it turns out our society doesn't really leave kids unmonitored for giant chunks of time anymore. There are a lot more supervised and organized activities. Um, even on the playground, adults are always present. Play is heavily monitored with strict rules in place. You can't throw snowballs, um, no wrestling, no daring each other to climb higher. And it turns out like play has been on a steady decline since the mid 50s at this exact same rate that um, anxiety and depression is increasing in, in adolescence. And the people that are monitoring it kind of have said that we're now at the point where we can move from calling it a correlation to actually declaring causation. So basically, back to the question of why we play. It appears that we play to learn critical life skills and to learn that we have the ability to solve our own problems and we're wired to benefit from that. So physiologically, we get chemically stimulated in the reward centers of the brain to encourage us to do more of that. Um, we play, that makes us happy. We improve the confidence we feel in handling our problems. Our confidence builds, we take on more of life's challenges. We build social networks, we lessen our feelings of anxieties, our social skills improve, we enjoy activities that bring us these feelings, so we do them more and we develop these skills. So playing basically creates this like upward spiral of mental goodness and it just keeps going from there. Thank you. Uh, does, do Kelly, Mike, John, do you guys have anything else to add to that? I mean, those are those are our really good, solid foundations. Um, obviously, Kim is referring to like Stuart Brown and other people who have done some really seminal work on play and its importance evolutionarily. Um, when we're looking at video games, sometimes there can be some arguments of like playing a video game is not evolutionarily advantageous. You know, being able to headshot somebody across Blood Gulch and Halo does not make me survive better. Um, one, one could argue. But the, the, same, the same tenets apply even in a game space. When you're playing a video game, you are doing something that is um, 
it's rewarding. It's challenging. It's social or a combination of all of those things. And those are just some really basic human needs that we need to get met. And as Kim mentioned, the amount of free play time that we allow children is declining. The amount of play time that we allow adults is like scandalous. And so it's not really a surprise that something that brings us that play experience from the comfort of our our home where we can't be judged. You know, if you saw a 35 year old going down the slide at the playground, you might have questions, which is unfortunate. Like it it really is because I love slides and I love swings. Um, But they're this way that we've been able to connect, especially for people in my generation. Like we came up on these games. This is how we've connected with one another. This is how we've gone through most of our lives as, um, you know, a connection point as a way to feel good and empowered. And like, we can have an impact on the world. And those are really powerful psychological motivators in terms of us finding, you know, what makes us feel good and valued and have like a sense of fulfillment in in what we do going forward. So even though it's not necessarily tied directly to evolution, you know, if you're saying playing video games, they're still very much in the same, the same domain. I'll chime in and just kind of add too. I think um, along with uh, what everybody else has already said, like, I like when I talk to parents about, you know, what they see is not the advantages of video games and like they can see like minecraft and like that there's math elements or things like that but i think there's a lot of non-appreciation for that idea of like my my student gets a math problem wrong and they're immediately disheartened and they're feeling anxious and they want to quit they fall off a mario platform and they're not like well i quit video games forever right like they're they're willing to give it another chance and they're willing to persevere um and then i'm gonna go with a completely random answer to this i guess because i think about it from an adult standpoint um, I don't think video games, and we're starting to, but video games have not gotten a lot of credit for being the art that they are. Um, and I think I have definitely been emotionally attached to video game characters just as much as books that I've read or movies that I've watched or TV shows. And I have definitely cried over characters dying in a video game just as much as those, you know, watching The Wire or any other show that's really gotten me um, in depth. And I think a lot of it has to do with that, that you know, that player choice, um, my ability to, to like I'm controlling what's happening in this game and, and I get connected to so like, I like as much as I enjoy games as, as kind of like to, to connect with the community and do other things. I also just enjoy um, the variety of worlds that it takes into just like a good book would. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll tie a bow on that and add a couple more things, right? The vast majority of have been said before, but you know, in going to new worlds, you know, there, there are a lot of elements of escapism and coping and stress relief and just the positive benefits of being able to do something that provides you joy in a safe environment that is now conveniently becoming more and more successful. I know that there was a study in, in 2021 that said about 60% of Americans, it's 227 million people, um, had played a video game within the last 30 days, right? And that many of those spikes were due to the pandemic and the related stresses of that. Um, as, as kind of one final comment, there's a, a TED talk by a brilliant woman named Jane McGonigal that I probably watch once a year. Uh, and, and she recounts Herodotus's story of uh, the King of Lydia in, in one of the, the first instances of games and, and what they were for. And I won't go too deep into it, but uh, long story short, there was an eight year famine and they said, hey, one day we'll we'll eat, the next day we'll play games as a means of distraction and coping through unpleasantries so that we can survive. And, and that's how that civilization survived for multiple years, right? So I think there are a lot of major benefits from the level of, of stress release, coping, and, and just dealing with the hardships of life that can come from any entertainment medium, but specifically participatory mediums like gaming. Yes, lots of love for McGonagall all around here. Um, <laughs> so next question, uh, what are the positive impacts of esports and gaming and how can they help with mental health? Kelly, would you like to start us off? Sure. So I know the, the panel before this one talked extensively about esports and its role in education. Um, and so I don't, I don't want to just kind of reiterate what they said, but in terms of esports, you know, at some point we're going to drop the E, you know, um, or it's just going to become synonymous as a a sport or activity. I know there's uh, some people who will disagree, but that's okay. You know, if you've ever played competitively, which I have, like it's exhausting. I can tell you going through, uh, you know, competitive halo match. It is it is intense focus. Like there's muscle tension. There's all sorts of stuff that goes on physiologically when you're competing the same way as if you were competing in other sports. Now, is it the same as football? 
No, you are much less likely to get a concussion playing esports than you are playing football. It is arguably a far safer activity. Um, there's another really fascinating thing that I love about esports, and that's the accessibility component. Not everybody can go out and play football. Not everybody is athletically inclined in that way, or soccer or softball. You know, some people, you know, they have limitations for whatever reason, whether it's asthma or, um, you know, muscle issues, or maybe they have a, a mental health issue that prevents them from actively being involved in these kinds of team sports. But when you allow people to play in a different way, you still allow them the opportunity to build those social bonds that come from being on team sports and to help allow especially adolescents and, and students you know, at college age too, the chance to win and to lose as a team, to learn sportsmanship, to learn communication and how to interact with one another when things are going well and when they're not. Like those are invaluable life skills that should not have to be tied to whether or not you can like take a hit. Um, and I say that as someone who played soccer for like a long time. Um, so, you know, having a mix is good. And if we should not discount video games as an esport just because they are video games. Um, again, that's kind of a controversial take. I don't think in this audience in particular, um, but but outside of this, I remember there's one point. Uh, I think they were trying to get esports as an Olympic event, uh, or they are at X Games too. And a couple of snowboarders were like, "You're not a real sport." And so then we get into gatekeeping and all that kind of stuff. But the the bottom line is that. It's an, an event, it's an opportunity for people to engage in sportsmanship and teamwork and collaboration and cooperation with one another. And it's in the avenue and the venue where we're seeing a lot of people, especially young people. Um, in therapy, we have the saying, if you meet the client where they're at. And so if where people are, you know, as, uh, as John mentioned, you know, two thirds of Americans play video games and that is much higher. The percentages are much higher when you're looking at younger adults. You know, you're bringing them these opportunities for collaboration and communication and social play through a place where they already are. And that's absolutely invaluable. Yeah, that's I feel like I, I did archery in the past and I feel like I'm sometimes more exhausted after playing like a competitive Valorant game than I was after an archery tournament. So it's kind of goes to show there are other ways to be tired. <laughs> um, so does anyone else want to add to this? I, I just, oh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say no, one, go ahead, one thing real, real quickly. Yeah. Um, I, I boil most esports down to hyper collaborative instantaneous decision making. Um, and those are a lot of jargon words together, but uh, they make something really beautiful and compelling when you think about it. Um, and I, I'd say esports specifically more so than just gaming holistically, the sense of achievement and the sense of community are, are ones that are prime drivers. Um, so I, I'd say that's really what makes esports so great. And I'd add challenge, you know, when you are about to, um, take on a challenge, when you're even just thinking about taking on a challenge, you, that's when you get these little hits of dopamine and um, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins. Those are the feel, it's like a magic elixir of feel good, mood elevating, learning, enhancing neurotransmitters that are all playing along in your brain. And that happens when you're skiing, you know, you're about to make this curve and you know it's gonna be hard. And, but it also happens when you're playing video games and it actually happens at a super fast rate when you're playing video games. And that's why you're tired afterwards, Shana, because you you have that same elevation. And, um, but you're also with your social group and you're pushing each other to take on new, new challenges and you're trying things that are hurt you know, harder. And it's, it's kind of like you have to wonder if um, in-game play isn't the modern version of free play from back in my childhood, right? You're basically unsupervised. It's, it's you and your friends that are getting into scrapes and having to figure out how to get out of them. And you're learning to trust in your own decision-making processes and your own abilities. So the real question is, if you can transfer, and there is a lot of debate around this, those in-game feelings of self-efficacy and self-confidence and skills that you're learning in-game out to the real world. I was going to share a quick story. Um, when we started the, the esports team at the high school I worked at, um, you know, there's a lot of pushback from from 
families and adults who did not understand why we would be wasting money on such a project. Um, and it started with just like, you know, 90, literally 95% of the students that we had in our esports program had never done any other after school activity before. This was finally giving them a home and something they could do and a community to be a part of. I mean, all the things we've already kind of talked about were like, they did not know how to be a team. They did not know how to communicate. They did not know how to do with the ramifications of like, oh, I usually just like join with a bunch of other random people and I can say whatever I want because we're not going to have to talk to each other again. No, you're going to go with like sit next to each other at the lunchroom the next day and you're going to have to talk about what happened. Um, but then what I thought was also really cool with the students that, you know, do take it so seriously because, you know, I'd hear the same complaints like parents like, oh, why are they going to play? They're going to play video games at home even more after they do this. It's like, no, no, they're like, that's not what we've seen. We've seen that if they playing it at school, they're not playing it as much at home. Um, but I mean, I had one parent in particular who was just like ready to like take me, take me to fight me as hard as he could. So I was like, you know, come to a practice. I want you to come and watch your kid and, and tell me that you think this is a bad idea. And sure enough, I, I mean, I'm sure he knew that he was being watched by his dad, so he was on his best. But, you know, this kid that you never get to see talk in class, never really participate unless you directly call on him. He was a leader. He was playing Rocket League. He was barking out the commands and communicating. And, like, dad just sat there slack-jawed watching his son turn into this this battlefield commander. And, and like, dad was like, all right, I get it now. He's like, I, I will, you know, like, I'm... You know, I, you know, he's not going to buy jerseys for the team anytime soon, but he totally understood why his son was so invested in this and why it was a worthwhile time because like watching his son develop these skills, feel that confidence and and be someone special within this little clique of people um, just made it, you know, worthwhile. And it was something that he just had never been able to conceptualize. I just was watching, you know, in his room playing by what appears to be himself and talking over the headset, but watching him in this room with other esports competitors and how much respect they had for him as like their captain and all that. Like it was like a really cool moment as a coach to be like, yeah, th I'm glad that's like, you can now go home and tell all the other parents that, you know, maybe this isn't as bad as you thought it was. That's awesome. I love talking about the positives of gaming and esports, uh, but I think it's also important to talk about the other side. Uh, so what are the current challenges you see with mental health in esports and gaming? Uh, John, do you want to go first this time? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll mention a, a few things that I think uh, everyone else on this panel can opine on far more graciously than me. But, you know, I, I think one of the problems that's faced is when you develop addictive tendencies that gaming is sort of the temporary solution, but it's usually based on something else that's undiagnosed and, you know, your addiction for anything to give you, you know, pleasure, be it video games or smoking or drinking or what have you, I'd still call video games probably a little bit better than some of those alternatives. But, um, you know, I think that's a major plague. Um, and, and I think from there, people have a pretty harsh stigma on, the positives of video gaming versus the negatives, right? Uh, so I'd say that. And then, you know, two others really, one is by playing full time when you have esports competitors, right? We have, you know, five different teams that compete all over the world. Uh, imposter syndrome is rampant, both from a player base and from a staffing base in, in such a competitive, easily replaceable mentality type of industry. Uh, and, and then separately, when you are a 16-year-old, 20-year-old, 25-year-old, and suddenly everything you do is scrutinized by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people in real time live, um, the backlash of mistakes, the incessant barrage of, of hate is tremendously detrimental to one's mental health. And, and I think those are some of the things that as we see video games really becoming the center of all popular culture and, and these players becoming bigger celebrities and figureheads, there's a lot of hate, there's a lot of negative comments, uh, and, and that's a lot to deal with. So those are my major points, but. And I, I can certainly jump in, but I saw, Mike, do you wanna go? Are you sure? Okay, cause I'll share, I promise. Okay, so as a clinical psychologist, I have thoughts on this idea around games and addiction, and they are they are in depth and uh, rather complex, and not this this is not the space for it. 
Um, but I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that anything done to excess is excessive. And it does not have to be a vice like smoking or cigarettes, literally too much oxygen and we suffocate too much water and we drown. If you exercise too much, you may have excessive exercising, but we would never in a million years say that a person is addicted to exercise. We would never say Simone Biles is addicted to gymnastics. We would say she's highly engaged in the activity. And that is such an essential nuance point that gets missed in pretty much any discussion ever about games and addictive tendencies. I want to be very clear that as a psychologist, when I hear the word addiction, I am thinking of the actual clinical term, not I'm addicted to Netflix. That's a, con that's a colloquialism and I understand that. But like actual addiction is when you are introducing a new chemical into the brain that alters your neurochemistry. Games are not doing that. You are not huffing Fortnite. It is not going in and changing, adding and, and altering the neurochemistry. It is releasing different neurochemicals that are already there, that are native. But guess what? So does eating chocolate. So does having sex. So does getting a hug or looking into the eyes of your infant. These are all things that release good feelings. So just being very careful with this term addiction because it is so broadly used and broadly abused, especially given the ICD-11, the International Classification um, Manual, for lack of a better word, for diagnosing mental and physical conditions at an international level. I think it's worth noting that it's not in the DSM, which is the American um, standard, our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychologists in America. We said, no, there's not enough research for that. The ICD said, you know, hold my beer. So just keeping it very clear that addiction is a clinical word and it has clinical meaning and being very, very careful with that. Um, so I that's the short for the version. record, I, I agree. <laughs> this is not my, yes. my personal view. <laughs> no, no, no I, I, I'm not calling you out on that at, at all. I, I, you know, you were very gracious in how you put it. I am, I'm just not as nice as you. Um, so that, that is a major thing, at least from my side, is there's this idea that games are addictive. You see headlines, video games are as addictive as cocaine. Not only is that just scientifically provably wrong, but that's clickbait and that's what people read. And so that's what people think. And not everybody reads journals for fun, like I do. And like, I'm sure Kim does too. So you know, I, I understand that. So that's, that's an important piece. And then specifically with esports, um, I think, you know, what John's saying is really important is that, you know, being a public figure at a young age can have a significant mental health impact. And we know that the gaming spaces are not the friendliest. Now that's not saying that that is inherently games. I mean, we used to burn witches at the stake. So maybe humans just are inherently kind of garbage sometimes, but the access to kids who are not cognitively developed to handle this kind of stuff, stuff that even grown adults can't particularly handle is really, really challenging. And so if you were to look at professional sports teams like football teams or basketball teams, they almost all have a sports psychologist. They have someone on the team that is helping their players with whatever is going on, whether it's family strife, addiction, you know, with alcoholism or, you know, fans getting in their heads and booing them. And I think if we want to hold our esports players up and they get the same attention um, that these professional players do, we need to make sure that they have the same support that these professional players do. Otherwise you're going to see things like burnout and people shutting down and developing depression and anxiety, um, trauma-based reactions based on their experiences in these spaces. So we, we need to take care of our athletes, whether they are you know playing soccer or they're playing Fortnite. I definitely feel like I have to jump in on that because yeah, I think uh, that's one of my like I'm there's like there's a whole other panel we could have about whether the NCAA is ever going to get involved with esports. I'm of the opinion that it's never going to happen because too many people are making amateur bucks um, doing random tournaments on the side, and the NCAA is probably never going to change their policies about what amateurism is and blah blah blah. Um, so I am very concerned that if we don't fall under the umbrella of the NCAA that means that we can treat those athletes differently and there is no way that we should be doing that because as we've already hit a hundred times here like there's just as there are many stressors there are many exhausting things there are many aspects of of esports that you need to make sure you're taking care of those people who are partaking and I can easily see scenarios where I mean we already are letting it slip through the cracks um, and especially at the collegiate level where I see all these colleges who are getting in on it and that's great because it's a growing industry and it should be recognized and it should be supported. Um, making sure that we have those resources widely available as we're growing I think is going to be really key to 
long-term success and not just burning out all these people because of all the things we talked about like i mean yeah like if you're a kid and you're dealing with all this social media pressure that people can just go online and say whatever they want and be toxic and garbage human beings like hopefully someone's going to be in your corner to talk you through that and help you process it um because i don't want to think about the alternatives if that doesn't actually come to fruition um and yeah i think that the other aspect that comes to all that is a lot of things we actually talked about on our earlier panels like i think of uh of the, the gatekeeping that happens, a sense of like, oh, you know, a female hops on the mic for her game and it's immediately, you know, all the horrible sexist things you can think about saying and commentary that's so inappropriate. And and that's just gonna be grading on a hobby that you wanna be able to enjoy and, and have fun with to not know that by being just who you are um, is gonna get trampled on. Um, and then I also think of uh, like, I mean, I as someone who worked in the K through 12 sphere, I like, and I've got, you know, a seven-year-old here at the home, like I see articles coming out about, you know, how Roblox is taking advantage of kids or how all these horrible people are, you know, in these unmonitored spaces. And I, and I get companies like they, 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 they say what they're supposed to say that they're working on it, that they have people monitoring it, but, but it's the internet. It is wide, it is big, and there will always be niche places that people are going to find trouble. Um, and, and I think that some of the stuff that we're seeing that, that is happening out there is is horrifying. Um, and I totally get why, like as much as I hate all the misconceptions and I hate the bad stereotypes of gamers, when you see those headlines coming out and we see what you know some of these people are saying and getting in trouble for, it's like, I can't fault people for for buying into those stereotypes and misconceptions and and not seeing the good that's coming out of it um, because it's it's really easy to focus on the negative. I, I think that's one of the, um current challenges. You, the cultural perception of um, gaming as less than other sports and other activities makes gamers automatically assume that the mad skills that they're developing in collaboration and teamwork and communication, like you were talking about earlier, Mike, with that, um, the father and the son, that father was cr being critical and, and devaluing what was his son's best, you know, skill instead of what he would do if he was the, the star of the quarterback, you know, on the football team where he would be bragging about him. And, and, and that's a missing piece. And I think that that makes our current challenge um, to, to help create that cultural shift in how we value the skills that are being learned in game and their ability to transfer uh, to, to the real world. You know, when I was a kid, I, I, was, I was not socially very adept <laughs> in the seventh grade. And so I read and I read for the wrong reasons. I didn't read books for, um, I read books to escape the real world and to avoid social situations and to not engage with um, real life because it was that books were better. And so I stayed up too late and I was tired in school. I read throughout math class, got in trouble at school for reading when it was inappropriate. Nobody shamed me for that because reading books is culturally lauded you know, being a bookworm and, and that there, you get a lot of um, positive support around that, even when I did it for the wrong reasons and to excess. So I think shifting that um, anything you do to escape the real world and to avoid focusing on your problems. And, and there is good information about video games out there that says, you know, it, players who play to escape um, that can lead down a bad road, but players who play because it's fun and they like to see their friends and they're up for the challenge, that leads to mental health and that that feel good upward spiral. It's it's playing to avoid real life problems and not learning how to deal with real life problems that can be an issue. So I think you nailed it with that 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 whole father-son scenario, and that we do have to learn to appreciate um, all the good that comes out and all the skills that come out and make that cultural shift. I think that happened some too during the pandemic. Um, what parents are, I'm a parent, I have a 
He was 10 at the start of the pandemic. He's 13 now. And if I told anybody I let him play on online, play video games three hours a day, I would have been shunned as a bad parent. But when he is in game, he's laughing and talking and doing what he's really good at. And we weren't playing in real life. He wasn't having any social engagement. That's a vital adolescent period of development. He's learning. He's if you um if I fill up my friend's house with lava, they're mad at me and they won't play with me for a while. And I have to navigate, I have to come up with the social skills to navigate that scenario, right? I have to figure out how to apologize, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And and they didn't get that from one hour of Zoom a day when we were all isolated, right? They got that in Minecraft and they got that in Fortnite and they worked as teams and they built those relationships. So, and, and what they aren't doing and what I don't know how to do is when his friends come over now, they want to just sit and play video games and I let them. But when I do kick them outside, because they do need to move their bodies, um, they don't, they haven't built their friendships around anything else at the same time, because that's all they had for the last three years when they were building those friendships. And so I do worry about that a little bit. Like, I think our kids need help figuring out how to expand those relationships to, to bigger parts of the world at the same time that we're making it okay to have, to be a good gamer at the same time. I have to selfishly back up here and comment on something John <laughs> said in relation to this. Shana and I have seen imposter syndrome so much at UAF of because, I, I mean, maybe just we don't have pick up basketball games the same way for, for video games, but we constantly probably once a month have somebody stop by and say, oh, I joined that team, but I know I'm not good enough for that game. And they are just full of self-doubt and hatred and, and because they've watched all these pros at the top level play. So if there are any students in the Zoom call who are still thinking about joining the team, come have some fun. I swear we're not that scary. It'll be a good time. <laughs> Yeah, that's super insightful. Thank you. Um, I think a kind of Kim helped us segue into the next question. Uh, but with the pandemic and COVID, can you all talk about how esports and gaming kind of just played a role into the mental health, uh, social elements, all that fun stuff? I'll start with a couple things briefly again, if that's okay. Um, yeah, so it, it's been really interesting on the boon that the pandemic has really driven for gaming and esports holistically, right? Like early in the pandemic, we saw major server issues across the globe for every large video game because we had unprecedented traffic. We had more players than any game has ever had in the history of, of playing video games, right? So I think in a lot of ways, it really moved esports forward, especially understanding that many traditional sports stopped but esports didn't. Um, so then it became, hey, this is the only way for me to hang out and do things with my friends when we're in separate isolation. Uh, it's the only way for me to, to, to do competition or to watch competition if that's important to me. Uh, so I think in a lot of ways, the pandemic has been really helpful in providing a, a means to connect in, in that esports has been kind of a common thread for many of, of our respective uh, stays at home. So. Uh, I just, I'd start there. So I guess I'll add from two different perspectives. One would be a, a clinical perspective. Um, working with the, the individuals that I do, gaming has been a really important part of their COVID experience, which is not a surprise. Um, you know, people's animal, there's lots and lots of articles out there about Animal Crossing bringing people together about people having weddings in Animal Crossing, people having funerals in Animal Crossing, and really just being kind of that digital playground for kids, as well as like digital coffee space for adults to, to connect with one another. So in that way, you know, I think games have made COVID more tolerable, which I, I don't think can be underscored. Um, one different perspective was that during 
2020, so the height of COVID, I did a study on the mental health of streamers. So whether they were casting esports or just gaming in general, variety streamers, whoever they were, to see kind of the impact. And so, you know, like John said, there was this a massive uptick in the amount of people who were engaging in gaming, whether they were playing, doing esports, whether they were streaming. And you could definitely see the toll it was taking on streamers. Um, the fact that they felt like they had to be there for their communities, even when they're going through the same trauma themselves. You know, the vast majority of mental or vast majority of streamers don't have a mental health background or really any training in mental health crisis. And I mean, you shouldn't have to, but they were getting people coming to their streams, talking about really heavy stuff that they weren't quite sure how to navigate. And so in, in that respect, yes, there was a massive influx of people relying on games and game communities to get those needs met. I mean, one of the foundational tenets of uh, kind of psychology during disaster is that humans come together. Like we need to physically come to one another and to support one another in times of hardship. That's one of the reasons COVID was so awful is that that coping mechanism in, in us just wasn't possible. We could not rally physically around one another to support one another. And so we did it in digital spaces. So it was wonderful that those digital spaces were there, whatever they were. Unfortunately, it did seem to make a pretty significant hit on the people who were facilitating those spaces. So whether that was streamers or community leaders, discord mods. Um, and so I think that's a, another side to it that doesn't get a lot to uh, a lot of talk about. And I could talk about that all day, but I'm going to stop. Uh, I actually believe that there's not much I can add to that because I think they all covered it pretty well. Um, but it was very interesting, I think, from from my point of view as the esports coordinator, I think when people think about esports, you know, they're thinking about, yeah, those those big competitive matchups, big flashy spotlights and all those kind of things. And I definitely noticed in our own discord and all those things that I was managing too, um, there was a massive shift to just kind of, you know, I don't want to say getting by, but it was definitely more people wanted to play their comfort games. People people were not looking to to be stressed out in a competitive game, people were looking to sell their turnips in Animal Crossing. I mean, one thing that we, um, Shane and I, we can talk about this one for a while too, probably, um, but we were surprised we offered to do a book club and we were gonna play a game together and we were gonna talk about the characters and the narrative. And we were kind of like, this is a silly idea. Surely no one's gonna want it. Like this is esports. they wanna compete and they wanna, they wanna and grind their rankings and, and do better at the things. And, and as soon as we pitched it, we had people that were immediately on board and wanted to get involved and, and like play a game together, just like reading a good book and hop in the Discord calls and talk about, you know, their own plays or watching other people plays like, oh, you made that choice or Shayna who accidentally hit the button to throw a ring away instead of keep a ring or other hilarious things that happened along the way. We definitely saw this pivoting in the in the gaming culture of like, yeah, people still wanted to play their their favorite esport titles or their their competitive things, but but the pandemic definitely seemed to make people kind of take a step back and and they want it. We I remember another successful thing we did. Um, and Chen, you're gonna have to help me out because I'm not hip and young and cool anymore. But we did like a we did like a nostalgia games night of like cool math games and Oregon Trail, and we're like this will be silly to make people compete in these things, but sure enough, people that's what people wanted to do. People just wanted that cozy feel good good moment because yeah the pandemic had taken a lot of things away from them and they had not been able to do a lot of these things but here with this this nostalgia they kind of go back and have some fun and laugh with their peers about about the the games they played growing up and and the things that they had fun doing and and get away from it all for a little bit yeah i think that was that was super fun because i feel like a lot of students like kind of forgot about cool math games or like you don't have time anymore when you're in college to like log on to browser games and just like getting to like even just me playing I, like I remember playing that coming home after school and like grinding my block store levels like it was just super fun <laughs> does anyone else want to add to the COVID thing or are we ready for the next question I'll take that as the next question um so what can organizations do to incorporate esports and gaming into wellness initi wellness initiatives? Mike, do you want to go first? <laughs> Actually, I was really wanting to hear what John and Kelly had to say, since I know they're both part of organizations that are already doing the things, and I'm more just envious and and uh, I want to take some notes so that I have better answers here. So I'm actually going to let one of them go first. John and I are playing chicken. Um, <laughs> I guess I lost. So, I mean, take this as an organization. I mean, that gaming is what we 
do like that. Everybody who's in our org, we love games, whether we make them or play them or stream them, whatever it is, you know, we, we really value them. And we, we think that there's value in that. Um, what, whether you're using them for, for mental health or whatever the reason, like we, we think games are good. And I think that you can help a lot of people through games, especially since that's, you know, again, therapeutically the place that they are in terms of making organizations more aware. Um, it's, I think the best example I have is just the clinical psychology community, which is definitely more niche. So I, I don't know, uh, Mike, how, how helpful this will be, but, um, most of the time when I'm talking about video games, I am having to convince people that games don't actually make people violent. Like I am still having the same conversation that has been ongoing since 1979 about games and moral panic. The research around games and addiction is not helping. The issues around loot boxes and people wanting to jump to conclusions instead of doing like due diligence and research and really understanding what we're talking about here does not help either. And so I think one of the biggest challenges organizationally, at least in my space is like, no, games are not inherently evil, but also they're not inherently gonna save the world either. Um, I do a lot of consultations around, I wanna make this, this game about mental health to help kids with X, Y, and Z. I'm like, that's a really great idea, but why does it have to be a game? Because if you can't answer that question, the same question, why does it have to be VR? Whatever mode of like you're doing, why? Is it because it's new and shiny? Or is it because there's actually an affordance within the medium that you're using that is going to improve someone's outcome? And most of the time people can't answer that question. And so I think it's really important from all sides organizationally is to continue to one, destigmatize games as not being inherently evil. I think it's also too important to destigmatize that mental health is also not in, you know, inherently evil. That's definitely a challenge in a lot of different spaces. And you know, it's still shocking to me that I think about, uh, I think the last statistic showed about a third of people still think that mental illness is some kind of personal moral failing, which is just, again, it, it's, it's shocking. So organizationally, continue to do the work, continue to be loud, continue to show up places, um, continue to knock on doors that are currently closed and just annoy them <laughs> until they give you a chance to speak on it. Um, and then a lot of times you can raise awareness. And then I guess on a hopeful note, at least in the psychology community, a lot of up and coming mental health professionals, um, you know, people who are a little bit younger than me, cohorts that have come after me, we all came up on games. We all know how important games have been to our mental health, our social connection, our ability to be with our peers and to feel a sense of achievement and all that fun stuff. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to see an organizational shift in psychology because this incoming class of mental health professionals largely even if they're not gamers, they don't see games as villains because games have always been there. They're not a new technology for them. They're just something that's always been. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that is helpful <laughs> at all. Um, like, you know, be stubborn, be loud and, you know, keep keep showing up even when people keep saying no. Um, that's that's kind of how, what I've had to do. <laughs> what I had to do. Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe John's got some better, some better info. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know if I really do. Um, you know, I I can more easily answer sort of the opposite side of the question, right? Like what, what do we do in, to incorporate wellness in, into our esports programs, right? You know, from from our perspective, and, and this is, you know, we're a professional organization. Um, you know, we have a, a PhD in in sports psychology, performance psychology, who who acts as, you know, many of, of our resources and, and he works with the teams every single day uh things as simple as you know bettering their communication and helping them identify identify problems and communicate them effectively to even the most simplistic of you know stretching and, and getting your blood flowing before a game and and you know doing things and getting out of their seats and, and engaging their their bodies between games so it's not so stagnant um because there are a lot of positive ramifications to those things um I think it's about touting the successes, right? You know, so so easy uh, to to everyone's point, right? It's so easy to to harp on a lot of the negatives because that's what people see. But there are a lot of pretty positive stories of of how gaming and, and esports have have led to some pretty great career successes, to some some pretty great you know personal successes. Um, you know, coming from the charity side, our, our founder, it's. You know, games were, were how we battled and eventually overcame his agoraphobia, right? So I, I think there are a lot of applications that you can utilize in terms of showcasing 
some of the positives of it and, and how to incorporate those into your respective programs. Um, but it's not the easiest battle. Uh, it, people like to, to hone in on, you know, 1% of the information and decide that's 100% of the information. Um, but I, I'd love to, I'd love to hear everybody else's take. I guess I have to chime in to also say, I, I think I block out how people still attribute violence in video games. Like, like people will like book Columbine or do these things. And I just like want to rip my hair out. And, and I'm like, how are these misconceptions still floating around? Um, but I do, I guess that's where I have a little bit of a hope for all of this is that it does feel like that there's, the progress is slow. Um, but it, it seems like we're starting to ask the right questions or we're starting to dig in a little bit deeper and not take the low hanging fruit. And yes, there's going to be all those people who want to take that, that one stick totally out of, out of context and, and try to blow it up like, like a big thing. Um, kind of like Kelly was saying, I think that there's enough people who are coming up where gaming has been destigmatized enough for them that, that maybe they're a little more willing to ask the questions of like, well, why, why are we, making this negative stereotype assumption why are we doing this 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 particular way um and then the other thing to what john was saying like and, and just kind of made me think about it um from our earliest panelist um court um she was talking about how she uses her gaming and her speedrunning community i mean they raised you know hundreds of thousands of dollars for malala fund um her partner organization gdq they raised millions of dollars for doctors without borders and prevent cancer foundation and there's all these really cool things that gamers are doing and it's so easy to to not notice it unless you're digging around for it or you're a gamer and you're already of the culture so you know you're following the social media platforms um so i think amplifying those voices that are just not being heard that to, to recognize like hey yes you can go with all these trolling articles and look what these horrible people did on a raid and twitch or whatever but look at all these really cool people who are also doing amazing work who are also trying to fight the good fight um, and giving their voice more more credence, um, which I'm hoping that the summit has been able to do somewhat for some folks um, of let them, you know, break some of these myths down and and keep spreading the word and keep having these conversations um, because it's the only way that 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 momentum is going to keep going is if we keep having these conversations and people keep asking their questions and we sort through this and get to the nitty gritty. Yeah, I think like we do extra life here at UAF. And I think that's like one of our, one of our big traditions from the esports club, the esports program. And it's super, not only like it's, it's great, but it's also super rewarding for people who participate. We had like a whole 24 hour stream, which was logistically kind of crazy, but you know, it was super fun. And I think everyone who played and watched was just like super invested and it really helps to like bring up those more positive elements that sometimes aren't as uh, on the forefront of people's minds. Um, so are you kind of a segue question? Uh, are you currently working on any projects, initiatives, et cetera, that deal with mental health, wellness, or anything of that nature in esports or gaming? John or Kelly, would you like to go first? Who is gonna lose the game of chicken this time? uh it, it'll be me it's fine um yeah so so especially speaking on on some of the the goodness that games does uh or gaming does I, i'd say my first job in in my career is is with a, a 501c3 called gamers outreach and uh long story short uh my good friend zach weigel hometown friend um started doing charity lands to raise money for children's hospitals and and really what it evolved into is uh, we build video game carts that we donate to children's hospitals all over the world. Each one reaches about 12,000 people a year. Uh, they're built like tanks. So they, you know, our, our original one that we donated, what seems like over a decade ago is, is still kicking in Mott Children's Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, but it, it also, it's a means of providing an equal playing field for a father and a son or a mother and a daughter or, or a friend and, and someone who, who has a long stay in a hospital to be able to, to do something in activity together and collaboratively that, that otherwise, you know, they wouldn't be able to go outside or, or you know, be in a, a less secure environment. So I think there's a lot of good that comes from that. In terms of my day-to-day, -day, uh, one of the things I, I focus on, and, and I mentioned it very briefly at the top of the call, is um, you are rad, so, so Rise Above the Disorder. Uh, it's a nonprofit that focuses on 
providing free mental health care to, to those who can't afford it otherwise. So uh, we operate mostly through a, a grant program. So people uh, apply, um, you know, those who, who receive our grants, we cover the cost of therapy. We help people find therapists. We, um, you know, cover all respective costs of the actual sessions of medication of, you know, Ubering to and from, well, I guess a lot of therapy these days is through Zoom calls. So that's great. Uh, but, you know, those are a lot of the things that I, I focus much of my time on just toward trying to, to help others who, who can't otherwise. And, you know, we, we spend a lot of time focusing on many of the issues that we talked about in, in you know, two questions ago in the esports side, uh, just because, you know, there are so many difficulties that come from, hey, I'm dealing with all of these things that I never knew I would have to be dealing with. And now I'm a celebrity and oh my God, it's a lot. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of good to be done there. Um, so yeah, those are some of the things that I'm working on. And on the, on the Dignitas side, we usually partner with RAD. I guess that's a conflict of interest, but not really. Um, you know, May is Mental Health Month. So uh, you'll see a lot of stuff from us and I'm sure many, many other amazing organizations uh, just promoting wellness and, and making the, the space a, a friendlier one uh, and a more meaningful one. So, yeah. That's me. Zach Weigel is a national treasure. I'll just try, I'll just say that. He his is other great. yeah, he, he's he's <laughs> his great. dog is so cute. Anyway, <laughs> he's got the fluffiest husky. In, anyway, um, so in terms of projects, I'm easily distracted by dogs. I apologize. Uh, in terms of projects that take this, we have a couple of initiatives that are currently out there. Um, one of them we have a, a repository of like therapists who are geeks or gamers themselves. So if you are looking for someone who you're not going to have to explain what discord is, you know, that oddly is something very difficult to find. Um, we offer that kind of service, obviously a lot of, um, game related mental health tools, resources, stuff that isn't just like general, here's a helpline, but like, here's something that's a culturally appropriate for somebody who's in a gaming space. Um, so that exists on take this.org. I personally am working on a project right now that I'm super excited about that is based on my research that I did on streamers and their mental health. And I'm working with Dr. B, who's our clinical director and you know the entire Take This team. And we're working on some um, really exciting resources around specifically addressing streamer mental health. We actually just released um, in conjunction with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and it was funded by Rainbow Six. We released a, a video about what happens when self-harm or suicide comes up in your chat. What do you do as the streamer? Um, so that's a project we have ongoing, and I'm currently working on something that I can't go too deep into, but basically it's an extension of that idea of here are the, the unique stressors of being a streamer in a game space. So, you know, burnout, parasocial relationships, trauma dumping, um, the difference between being a mental health advocate and then straying across that line of actually giving any kind of clinical advice, which is actually very dangerous and you should not do. Um, you know, what is it, what is it like if you are say a mental health professional who streams, what are your ethical responses? Abilities and how can you take care of your community? If you're an advocate, same thing. How can you take care of your community while also taking care of yourself? And really just developing these really robust resources for streamers because it doesn't exist. Like you can't go to the National Alliance on Mental Illness or Mental Health America and look up, hey, I'm stressed as a streamer because you know I'm getting hate rated and the Twitter mob is coming after me and DDoSing me offline. Most people don't know what that means. So, you know, the, the challenges that streamers face, that gamers face are, are unique. And so working on developing resources that are clinically informed, um, that are based on evidence that I know as a psychologist, and I also know are really important as, you know, a content creator and as a streamer and as a gamer, bringing those two fields of expertise together to really help my fellow streamers. I'm, I'm really excited about that project. I'm withdrawing from the world to finish my dissertation. <laughs> but that's, that's my upcoming project, but I am going to be um, uh, teaching psychology of play again and converting hopefully, you know, 30 or 40 more, more students to loving play and appreciating how play does contribute positively to life and the world around them. It's spring of 23, I think. 
conveniently, I'll just say that I, I guess I'm working on this, bringing all these people together <laughs> for the eSports Summit, um, to have these important conversations, to figure out where, where the research needs to go, to figure out what people need to hear. Um, so, so thank you all for being a part of what UAF is currently trying to do to help uh, be a part of, of this shift in the culture. Yeah, thank you so much. There is so much like information uh, in this panel and it was so super helpful. Um, does everyone want to plug their organizations? Like where can we go find out more about everything and where to join? Sure, I'll jump right on that. Um, so uh, again, I work for Take This. You can find us on all the socials at Take This Org. So that's super convenient. We also have a really lovely Discord. So if you like to hang out with people who like games and mental health, um, and you think I'd be an awesome community manager, which I am, uh, you can check us out on our Discord, which is discord.gg slash take this org. Um, and then our main website is take this org. Uh, I'm sorry, take this dot org. Wow. I'm sorry. It is 10 PM where I am. So I'm a little bit loopy. Um, but yeah, take this dot org is our main website. And then if you want to get at me, um, you can find me. I pretty much live on Twitter or our discord and you can find me on Twitter at Kelly N Dunlap. That's K E L L I. Cause my parents wanted to make my life difficult. Uh, N, and then my last name Dunlap D U N L E P. And I would be delighted to talk with anybody about anything mental health and games related because it's it's kind of my jam. So thank you. I guess <laughs> you never you never know when to go off mute. It's, it's I great. know uh, that's the new challenge. Yeah, I'll put them in the chat as well. Uh, so so my socials are all spire on everywhere so s-p-i-h-e-r um for rise above the sorter it's it's urad.org uh gamers outreach is gamers outreach.org and then my actual day job dignitas is uh dignitas.gg but i'll put it all in chat it'll be clickable it'll be great awesome yeah thank you all i think everyone has learned a lot. And I think the pandemic and just being able to talk about mental health more like destigmatize it is super valuable. Um, yeah, I think unless we have anything else in chat, I think that's a great way to sign off the eSports Summit. Thank you all for attending and great job, Shana. And thanks to our panelists for uh, being there and thanks to all of our attendant attendees as well. So this was great. Have a good weekend and um, hopefully uh, Shana will see you over at the eSports Center for some cake. So <laughs> have a good yes, one. Please have cake. <laughs> Bye, Thanks so Thanks much, everybody. Thanks so much. Yes.